Crispin Sarwell, good to see you. Good to see you, Dan. How you doing up there? Oh, boy. Well, as, as people can see, I'm not in my normal environment. Um, that's because I'm in New York in my parents' house um, dealing with a sort of a family emergency. Uh, two weeks ago from last Saturday, my father, I had to hospitalize my father. My daughter and I were visiting, and my father started falling. Um, he wasn't strong enough to get back up. I had to hospital. He's 91. I had to hospitalize him, and it turned out he had a lung infection. And, um, which I didn't know when people that old can cause hallucinations and weakness and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And, um, the situation is unresolved. He's, he's physically pretty much out of the woods for the most part, but mentally is not completely back. And so, um, I'm is your daughter still there? My mother still lives in the house. Yeah. She's herself early stage Alzheimer's. And um, the house yeah. really is not set up for people in that condition. Um, for years, I was trying to convince them to sort of either move into a place or have a much more substantial support here. And my father, who is a very strong-willed man, um, refused. Uh, and so I'm kind of now left picking up the pieces, which is hard. Yeah. But and, I'm soldiering on. And teaching remotely, right? Yes, and so I um, I talked to my university because I'm not going to probably be able to go back for the rest of the semester. Mm. And they are very kindly allowing me to finish my classes from here wow. by recording video lectures and doing that sort of thing. The hardest part, other than the situation itself, is that my wife and daughter, my adolescent daughter, are in Missouri and... Um, it's my, my adolescent daughter is having a difficult time not being resentful and angry and uh, wanting me to come back. Wow. Um, and she well, it's and, good that she wants that, though. <laughs> she and her mother, of course, are, have to be fighting because that helps. And um, so, uh, you know, well, I'm finding she, out what I'm made of, Crispin. I'm finding yeah. <laughs> Shit, man. I'm sorry to hear all this, dude. Yeah. That is pretty much what I'm made of. This shit is what I'm talking about. No. no. <laughs> um, so, but gosh, am I happy to be doing this. It's such a relief um, to be doing something normal. And That's good, um, man. to be doing it with, uh, with you. Um, I'm glad to be doing it too. We, um, our, our, our topic today is one that I think many blogging heads people will uh, – We'll, we'll be happy that we're doing, and I know that some very specifically, so shout out to O'Reilly, shout out maybe to Axel's Castle, who has talked about this. Um, we're going to talk about the analytic continental philosophy split, um, and you, Crispin, are almost a perfect person to talk to about this, because typically you talk to somebody either from analytic philosophy or someone from continental philosophy, and then you get a very skewed picture Indeed. The philosophers think the continental philosophers are a bunch of flakes, and the continental philosophers think the analytic <laughs> philosophers are a bunch of pedants. Yes. And Or pinheads. Right. And um, <laughs> you do both, and part of the reason you do both, I'm assuming, is because your dissertation advisor was Richard Rorty, who did both. Yes. And so the way I would like to do this, Crispin, is – to ask you to talk to us about how you have incorporated both into your own work and thought with an eye to maybe giving people a sense of what the differences of between the two traditions are that isn't jaundiced with respect to one or the other. Right. That would be rare, right? Like uh, it, it really is hard to talk to people about this and there's not too many people who cross. Yeah. And I guess I thought, you know, when I was working with Rorty in the 80s, uh, I think he thought and I thought, following him in a way, like that the distinction would break down, uh, that it would, it would, it was no longer viable in a way. Uh, I, they've been saying that for decades, but it yes. hasn't happened. No, it hasn't. And uh, I find that disappointing, but understandable too, um, just because these discourses are so far apart from each other. Like, they just, you know, each one features, at this point, a hundred years of, 
of dogma. I mean, a hundred years of, of uh, jargon. Let's, uh, maybe some dogma too, but maybe not. Um, you know, so like a vocabulary that's developed, you know, through dozens of figures and, you know, dozens of decades or a dozen decades at this point. And so it's almost like two separate disciplines, right? Like just, you know, mastering either one of them would be like a lifetime task, really, and much less trying to do both. And then plus people's training gives them a stake often and a view on this, you know, like, uh, and then, you know, so like when I arrived at Johns Hopkins uh, in 81 or so. Now you're an undergraduate? That's why, uh, that's why I got my MA. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, it was a pure, uh, analytic department in like such a classic way. Like they, we, they told us basically, I remember people saying, professors saying to me things like, there's really no point in going back beyond Frega. Okay. You know, like the, like history of philosophy was not really relevant to them. They had no one who really did it actually among their dozen professors or whatever, like even history. But then the, the view on continental was straight up, don't bring that stuff in here. Don't even mention those names. Those, that's not philosophy, right? So, um, but I mean, I had gotten into philosophy probably through Nietzsche above all, you know? Uh, and even as an, you know, uh, even in high school, I was dipping into Sartre and Heidegger like that's kind of what excited me, you know. There was even in the seventies, existentialism still seemed kind of, you know, hip and dangerous a little bit, you know. Or uh, um, yeah, I'd read existentialist literature in high school. Yeah, without having read any any of the philosophy, <laughs> um, you know. So I'd read some Camus. Yeah, and some Sartre in high school um, um, before I ever studied philosophy. So yes. And literary excellence. And Dostoevsky also yeah. read uh, parts of Notes from Underground and Crime and Punishment in high school. Yeah, yeah and I, I'm teaching existentialism right now. And, you know, one thing about it is, I, you know, I don't know how relevant this is right here, but the, the literary excellence of that material, uh, you know, whatever you think of the philosophy, finally, like, uh, you know, like, does it all hang together or does it, you know, like, I think Sartre is kind of a mess or whatever, but, like, the writing is beautiful, all right? Like, it's, it's you know, I think that's what attracted me to a lot of these texts. Yeah, um, and I, agree. It, I agree with that. I think the yeah. liter I think it's a better literary tradition than a philosophical tradition. Um, well, uh, existentialism may be per se. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. That's yeah. what I'm, I'm talking about existentialism now. Yeah. Um, I think Camus' The Plague is probably one of, uh, probably the five books that is, that has moved me the most. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, I remember was. reading it. I remember the experience I had reading it. You know, I mean. Um, yeah. I just taught No Exit uh, by Sartre. You know, it's, it's, it's really wonderful. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, so when I arrived there, they basically just said, you can't bring that stuff here. But even at Hopkins at that time, so I, I went to the English department and stuff like this. So Stanley Fish was teaching there, and I mean, he's not, he wasn't exactly a continental philosopher, but he was definitely thinking about Derrida, sure. and Foucault, and Rorty, for that matter. Uh, this was before I knew Rorty. And, uh, you know, so I, I kind of, even there, I was kind of feeling my way out into some of the other stuff, which is not to say that I didn't, I got quickly seduced by analytic philosophy. Like, I... You know, as soon as I started reading Quine and Kripke, uh, you know, Kripke was rocking right then. Like, Naming and Necessity was pretty recent. The Wittgenstein book came out right in, when I was in grad school there at Hopkins. And, um, I mean, I just, I, I fell in love with that stuff. But I also felt like it, and, and it's, I, res, you know, tremendously learned to respect its precision. Uh, and actually, there's a lot of good writing in analytic philosophy as well. Yeah, there's more than people realize, but yeah. it's it's a pretty tight group of authors in analytic philosophy that I th would say are excellent writers. Yes, and there's the ratio of excellent to not excellent is 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 relatively low. Um, yeah, that, no, that's definitely true. But like you know, when I was I just mentioned Quine and Kripke. Okay, Quine's a great writer. Kripke's yeah. a great writer. 
Um, um, I think that um, um, Cavell is a great writer, though he's yeah. very hard. Yeah. All right, <laughs> going back to Russell. Russell's a great writer. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, but so I, you know, right. So I, you know, I was definitely confronted with the choice. Like it has to be one way or another is the way they presented it. Uh, and also just the, that it, Continental was discreditable, you know, discredited. Uh, the, the way they talked about Continental philosophy, they just despised it. And they, you know, and they had virtually no acquaintance with it as well. Um, so I, I tried, like, I, I almost secretly kept dipping into the uh, Continental side or, like, trying to take some graduate classes in other departments that broach these topics a little bit. Wait, um, wait a minute. It cut out a little bit, so I want to... Unfortunately, again, to viewers, I'm very sorry about this, but I'm on a Wi-Fi, which is part of the reason why this is not the crystal clear. You were saying that you kind of that that they despise the the writing of the Continental philosophers. Well, no, they just they, well, they, I'm sure they did. They thought it was straight up nonsense, right? Like right. it was just it was almost comical how people were seduced by this meaningless crap, you know. And to be fair, that goes back quite a long way. I mean, I mean. Um, Rudolf Carnap wrote a whole piece, sort of dismantling Heidegger. Right? Yes. I mean, I mean, you know, the being of non-being is the is the asshole of my being. Right? I mean, it's just sort of you know the nothing um, nothings. Right? Was right, right. And so and so yes, that's a that's been a long-standing complaint of analytic philosophy against. It's not just contemporary analytic philosophers. The great yes. tradition of analytic philosophy, yes. in some way, was opposed to what they saw as a kind of obscurantism. Um, and let me just ask you, I mean, I, 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 you know, just to throw out what little knowledge I have, I mean, the impression I got with respect to, you know, the positivists' uh, dislike for kind of philosophy was twofold. One was that, the, that it was obscurantist. Yeah. But I think that they also, I, I, thought, I thought that I caught a, a bit of a thread of kind of a worry about the relationship of this kind of language to propaganda and especially fascist propaganda that they didn't they were concerned about the romanticism of it right um, um okay. you know the yeah the, 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 you know the, the the leader of the people is the spirit of the nation and this kind of sort of talk right in other words I I never said thought, like that. i've always thought that part of the reason for the verification theory of meaning was a concern was a political concern huh about the way that language could be used, because you know the the Vienna sort the positivists, a lot of them were Jews, true. A lot of them were liberal, and of course Heidegger became, was a Nazi. Yes. <laughs> and so, do you see any relationship between the obscurantism on the one hand and also a kind of romanticized nationalist, let's say, language that then could be used for very nefarious purposes? Well, that. I mean, Carnap didn't quite say that about. No, about no, no, no. Him. I'm saying that. I'm wondering yeah. about that. I um, mean, it's it's worth being suspicious, I guess. Uh, and and it's and it's true in some ways that fascism emerges from romanticism and stuff like that as well. Um, and it also out of a kind of an imprecise language, a kind of a taking a kind of liberties with language, right? What the hell is the spirit of a nation? What the hell does that mean, right? Okay. What is a volk? What is a volk? What does that mean, right? right? I mean, you know. Well, but these are pick that apart, right? Um, um, yes, but that didn't seem to be the the basic mode of critique. Like, uh, and Heidegger isn't really about the spirit of the nation and stuff like that, you know. Yeah, I, I do think that the debate often is stuck in that Carnap Heidegger moment. Okay, so that was like the almost the last moment where they really addressed each other directly, especially figures that eminent, right? Um, and so, like, when I talk to my friend who's spent his whole life in continental philosophy, he doesn't think analytic philosophy is anything but positivism. Mm. Okay? Like, he just says, like, look at that narrow, scientistic bullshit, you know? Like, uh, you know. It's not entirely wrong, by the way. I no. mean, I'm no. not sure I believe that the spirit of positivism ever really left. I mean, I see a lot of it in the contemporary naturalisms and – eliminative materialisms and reductionisms, I'm seeing a lot of, I mean, the whole reductionist program was positivistic. It comes out of Ernest Nagel's structure of science, right? Well, true, but, uh, you know, then I'm trying to tell him that, guess what? 
positivism has been refuted insofar as any philosophy can be refuted. Yeah. And it was analytic philosophers who did it, you know, uh, completely. Yes. <laughs> right. So, like, come back, you know, come with me to the last 70 years on this thing, okay? Uh, and then, you know, and then you talk to uh, analytics, and they they really come back to Heidegger. Like, they, you know, their, their picture is just Heidegger, and then it's kind of fascistic or something like this. I mean, you definitely couldn't condemn continental philosophy as a whole as being like connected to fascism and I think in any direct way. I mean, there's, there's problematic moments. Of course, Nietzsche is a central figure for many of these people. Uh, and that there's political issues there. Um, Heidegger. You were, just saying, you were just saying, I'm sorry, it just it cut out a little bit again. You were, yeah, just, yeah. you were just saying that it's unfair to saddle continental philosophy with fascism. And I think that's true. And I wasn't intending to do that. Yeah, I was yeah. just more wondering whether there are some elements of the the linguistic critique that the positivists did that maybe reflected or echoed some worries yes. of the ways in which in that the imprecise and romanticized uses of language could be put politically in that yeah. period that they were writing in. I wasn't I wasn't trying yeah, to yeah. saddle it. Although, would you not say that there is a sort of a somewhat disturbing tendency towards illiberal politics on the part of continental philosophers. I mean, Sartre had his flirtation with the, with the Maoists and, yes. um, and Heidegger of course was a Nazi. I mean, you don't hear a lot of robust defenses of liberalism from continental philosophers with the exception maybe of Habermas, right? Um, yeah, that's true. Um, and Habermas is probably one of the, you know, most eminent liberal thinkers of the last 50 right. years. So do you think it's an exception. unfair to wonder about sort of the, the, Ill, the illiberal tendencies of continental philosophers? Well, uh, but there, yes, I think that's legitimate. Um, there are lots of varieties of illiberalism, though. Uh, so, you know, you have Heidegger's, uh, you, you know, Heidegger's fascism, Sartre's, you know, he's fighting for the resistance in Paris or whatever, okay? Uh, and then he flows toward a Marxist standpoint, partly because all of Europe is polarized. You know, you've got to choose Nazi or commie. Right, um, right. And yes, and now I would think of Foucault, for example, his philosophy is basically having a liberatory politics, though not a liberal politics. Yeah. Like yeah. he's definitely suspicious of liberal politics in many, many ways. Yeah. But, but I wouldn't, definitely not associate him with an authoritarian politics either. Yeah, right. Uh, right. But yeah, I think it's worth getting worried on political grounds about these things. Uh, yeah. And it, I think it's quite right that there's not a, like a through strand of liberalism in that tradition. Yeah. You know, Habermas is an exception, although he's a gigantical exception. Yeah. Yeah. Now I've been, I keep, I've been interrupting you. So please. So we were, you were talking yeah. about, your background and how you got into this interesting position of, of combining right. these two traditions in your work. Yes. Yeah. Of maybe helping us to understand what the differences between the traditions are. So please continue. Yeah. Okay. You were at, you were at Johns Hopkins. Right. In the eighties. <laughs> and then I guess you moved on and, and that was when you really started to integrate because you were working with Rorty. Yeah. You know, actually, believe it or not, also I, what really sent me to Rorty was that I got interested in Dewey's aesthetics. So like, here's another, there's a third strand, right. Of, uh, American philosophy, which I guess is not as prominent, uh, that American but, pragmatism. Yeah. Yeah. But that too got extruded by the analytic side. Um, and so I was, I was wanting to write a dissertation on Dewey's aesthetics and I just started asking people like, who could I do that with? And definitely not at Hopkins. You know, no one knew anything about pragmatism, uh, although they didn't condemn it with quite the same uh, oomph yeah. that they condemned the Continentals. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I guess we got these three things going. But anyway, I ended up in Virginia working with Rorty on Dewey, and um, I just watched him, yeah, I watched him work with, through Habermas, you know, Gadamer, who appeared in our graduate seminar at one point, a uh, friend of Rorty's. Uh, Rorty loved Jacques Derrida. I mean, he, you know, like he would just sort of go on gratuitous uh, digressions about how great Jacques Derrida was and how hilarious he was. 
who other than Heidegger is the main boogeyman of analytic philosophers, mm. I would say. Yeah. Um, for pretty good reasons, actually. Right. Uh, yeah, Rudy used to say that he would be riding the, uh, the subway in Paris or whatever, reading Derrida and just laughing out loud continuously and stuff like this, uh, which still surprised. I'm still trying to figure out how that could be or what that meant. Uh, they were friends too, actually, uh, Derrida and, and Rorty and Habermas. But um, yeah, so in Rorty's circle or, uh, you know, like in, in his, uh, uh, his, his sphere of influence, you had to try to master both, okay? Like, uh, you know, so even to have a conversation, like a philosophical conversation with Richard Wordy, he was going to fly from Donald Davidson to Jacques Derrida in the course of a single sentence. He thought they were saying the same thing, basically. Uh, and, you know, so in other words, to even deal with his philosophy and deal with him as a teacher and stuff, you know, I, I started to try to expand, to read, you know, contemporary continental um, sort of under his guidance or whatever. Now, you know, most continental philosophers or people who spent their lives on that definitely reject Rorty's <laughs> account of these figures and so on. Right. But, but this is something I just loved about Rorty, actually, is that he didn't care about that yeah. uh, distinction. Like, he was just operating completely across it and ignoring it. And, you know, maybe emphasizing, overemphasizing the uh, similarities. But there were some similarities, okay? So, like, you know, Rorty, um, well, I mean, he pointed out quite simply that both sides were obsessed with language. Yeah. Okay, like the whole century on both sides of the ditch. The linguistic turn was ubiquitous in the 20th Yes. Century. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And, and, you know, Rorty, after he wrote that, after he assembled that anthology, the linguistic turn, which was basically all uh, analytic, you know, it struck him like this is happening in continental philosophy as well, it, with a completely different vocabulary. But, you know, and, and maybe, you know, there's the way Rorty saw it, there's a kind of linguistic constructionism arising in both traditions. Right. That, that, yeah. that, that at least is pushing at the, at the, at the it pushing at having a metaphysical implication, right? I mean, you know, it's, I would say if you wanted to talk that way, sort of, the Goodman sort of ways of world making kind of thing exactly. is probably the most continental thing an analytic philosopher would do, right? In a, in a certain way, right? I mean, instead of instead of allowing that line between language and reality to be really sort of porous, right? Yes. Um, 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 and which quiet yeah. always only flirts with, it seems to me. Ontological, right, ontological relativity is as far as he goes. Right. It's not clear that that's world making quite in the way Goodman means. It seems to me. No, I don't think so either. Yeah, yeah. It, no, Rorty wanted to read it more like that, probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. It'd be interesting just to think about Quine and Goodman, right? They're, they're writing in the same place at the same time, and Goodman's a little more radical and sort of the, almost going toward a pretty linguistic relativism, kind of. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, but I, yeah. I mean, I, he would resist that characterization, I bet, but I, I see it that way. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and that's and those were the elements of the continental tradition that Rorty was most interested in. The things that seemed to move like, OK, he totally rejected the accusation of relativism. And, you know, we could try to talk about that. But I, but that, that was the continental philosophy that he was most sympathetic to is stuff that could be read that way, especially Derrida. Uh, but he read Heidegger that way. But in your case. You're very much you bring on board a lot of 19th century continental philosophy, right? I mean, in other words, sure. that original continental analytic split is is I thought traditionally understood as a split that occurs post Kant, right? In terms of how do we, what the proper interpretation of Kant is, it was the original sort of. <laughs> is that not correct? Well, I mean, I think you could narrate this a lot of ways. I've got a little story, though, I, I try to tell. I'd rather hear your story than, than give my half-assed, probably largely ignorant one. So I'd rather hear your story. Hey, man, I'm into your half-assed, ignorant story, dude. <laughs> I, 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 no. <laughs> um, well, and, and this is kind of half-assed, too, and I haven't thought hard about this for a long time or tried to do all the research that would be necessary to pay this off. Okay, but this is how I, this is how I look at it. 
you get right around 1900, you know, or building through the 1890s, European and even American and British philosophy are dominated by German idealism in the late 19th century. Okay, so like you've got people like Ramsey, McTaggart, Green in the in, in Oxford and Cambridge for instance. Hold on, just cut out. Ramsey, McTaggart, and Green. You said. Yeah. Okay. No, like T.H. Green. Right, right. Uh, and so the, you, yeah, you, yeah. you view the utilitarians as sort of outliers. I guess so. That's interesting, yeah. Because I mean, they strike me just, there's just an extension of empiricism, right? Yeah, basically, yes. Yeah. Um, that, I mean, that's, an, yes, that's, that's something to think about because like Sidgwick, for example, you know, in other words, sounds more like an analytic philosopher than T.H. Green, his contemporary sounds. Right, right, um, right. So there, there's, two, there's definitely more than one thing boiling at once. But the German idealist influence is larger and, and encompasses more people is what you're saying. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. dominates the academy, really. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All over the world, really. I mean, you know, or at least in the, you know, uh, so in the British universities, in American universities in the late 19th century. So it's either sort of post-Kantians or Hegelians or, you know, people trying to push beyond but further into what Hegel was doing or something like that, someone like McTaggart, let's say. And it's, you know, and there's been a hundred years of that by then. And it's gotten more and more obscure or seemingly like, like what is this even about after a yeah. while? Yeah. You know what I mean? So like the, the jargon is so elaborate and just sort of coming at it raw, yeah. you might think to yourself like, this is fantastical. Like, how did this, you know, like, like I, I'm not even sure that this should have started, much less gone on for this hundred years. And, and you know, so you got G.E. Moore and Bertrand Russell. They're sitting in Cambridge, and their teachers are all, you know, Kantians and Hegelians. They're, you know, they're still spinning out the web. And, and they, I think they're just poking each other in the ribs, Russell and Moore, going, did you understand anything right, there? This is, like, batshit, this is batshit crazy. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, and it's funny because from my training, which of course is analytic, I would say that that whole tradition is just a flat out misinterpretation of Kant, right? Um, 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 look, Kant, in my, to my mind, is just a very sophisticated, much more cognitive Humean, right? Um, um, and and the, the whole point is that the noumenal is in principle unknowable. Right. right. right? Right, the world is the world as experienced, right? And okay, it almost seems like the whole German idealist tradition is based on exactly what Kant said very plainly is unknowable, right? Yes, uh, and I mean, um, Hegel's, Hegel's explicit about that, you know, and Fichte and Schelling too, and they're working off Kant, and they're, I mean, they're trying to bring the noumenal uh, out from the shadows or something right. like that, yeah. right? Yes, the different readings of Kant are pretty key, actually. Now that now that you mention it, you know, yeah. reading Kant as an empiricist is not ridiculous. No, I don't think so. Um, no, but he called himself an idealist. You know, which is interesting. And then he yeah. fucks around with it in the ethics and stuff because he wants to give you a noumenal self that's not bound by causality, right? So I mean, you know, indeed, he kind of he kind of I don't know he kind of problematizes the interpret his own interpretation. Um, yeah. But if you just read the Critique of Pure Reason, you know, you didn't start to go into the stuff that required, you know, you could really come out of it with saying, look, this guy's just an empiricist who understood that mind penetrates the world as well as the world penetrating mind, right? I mean, that's, that's sort of, that he was, he was cognitive, whereas Hume was sort of more crude in his, in his, <laughs> he was more yeah. behaviorist almost, right? I mean, um, um, with some very, very minimalistic representationalism, right? But, but, but for Kant, that Kant really understood the sense in which, yeah, no, it's not. You can't just make this simplistic primary secondary quality distinction. The things that are in the mind and the things that are in the world—they're all entangled together, right? Right. Um, okay. And they're not, and they're not disentangleable. That's the that, that's what the, what I comes out yeah. to be from Kant. Um, and so I wonder to what extent, see, that's why I always thought that the analytic continental split was about a disagreement over how to interpret Kant. Well, um, I, I, that's in there somewhere. Yeah, uh, anyway, go on. So, yeah. But as a matter of fact, you are obviously correct that the German idealism dominated yeah. 
with a few utilitarian sort of, you know, sort of having a little outpost, right? Right, who are still incredibly clear or whatever, right? Like and then to Russell like and Moore come along, and that's when it starts to... But wasn't Frege before Russell and Moore? Yes, but, you know, Frege was a German mathematician. It, it, it's through Russell, it's through Russell Hold that on, Frege... Got, it's through Russell that Frege winds up getting getting airspace, right? So it's yes, airspace. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right, Russell takes Frege's logic and brings it into philosophy fully. Right. I mean, it's true that the whole analytic program, I think, can be read off of Frege. Like, if you read those early papers of Frege, uh, Sense and, and Reference or whatever, the whole analytic tone is there, actually. You know, so yes, I, you know, and isn't but there, Russell... Isn't, isn't there a sort of a, a, an embryonic representation of the analytic continental split between Frege and Husserl? Yes. Yes. Okay, so one thing I think, like this moment around the turn of the century, uh, it's lots of things are happening, I think, like sociologically, or like sociolo sociology of knowledge kind of stuff. So one thing about this German idealism is that even though Hegel kept saying he was doing science, you know, and Marx keeps saying he was doing science, and people like Freud said they were doing science. Right. You know, the period around 1900 is a really, it's a scientistic period, especially in universities. Like, it, it becomes at that moment, science becomes like sort of the only respectable source of knowledge. So every discipline has to defend itself on the grounds that at a minimum, it's not incompatible with science. Right. At a maximum, it's scientific itself. You know, somewhere in between, it might be useful for science or a handmade to science or like clarifying science or something like this, like the positivists, I think, thought they were doing. Um, but like you, you, there might not have been philosophy departments 20 or 30 years into the century if they hadn't made this move because when you're thinking of science in this kind of pretty straightforward empirical experimental vein as the basic or even only source of human knowledge, this German idealism just looks ridiculous pretty yeah. quick. And yeah. so like pretty soon, like deans are saying like, do we need this? Does it, you know, does this do anything for anyone? And the, and the profession is in crisis where, where philosophers are writing things like we haven't achieved anything in a hundred years. Like we, you know, like, what does this even mean? Like, what are we doing? And how can we defend our spot in the university, actually, or just our spot in human knowledge? Yeah. And like, I think you see different reactions to this. Husserl is an example, I think. Like, the, like he's, he moves pretty straight out of this idealist tradition. And, you know, he's trying to narrow it down, make it a lot more clear, give it foundations that are possibly scientific, like this kind of, immediate contents of experience or something like that, or at least not incompatible with science. Right. I, the rise of pragmatism in the U.S. at exactly the same point has really the same tone. So Peirce yeah. and, you know, is saying like, you know, his model for knowledge, Peirce's model for knowledge is science. Empirical <sighs> science, you know, pretty narrowly understood. And, you know, he develops pragmatism as a theory, as a philosophical theory to underpin developments in empirical science. And all of them also have the sense of, let's get rid of the mumbo jumbo. Like there's been just a lot of stuff that we don't even know how to evaluate. Like you wouldn't even, if this was true, what would be different? Or you know what I mean? Or if it's, and so I think like all over the world kind of, or you know, in the, in the European and European American type of world, um, you get all kinds of reactions almost simultaneous that it's time to ditch this German idealism for yeah. sure yeah. and come into something that's clearer, something that's more respectable in an academic context. So then uh, how do you get something as obscure as Heidegger out of that? Right, good question. All right, um, I've been thinking about this because I just I knew, I knew we were going to talk about this. I think what one of the biggest differences is the continental – tradition ends up, their response to the scientific moment ends up being kind of hostile. 
And mm. the, you know, so that like if you read Heidegger's question concerning technology, you know, he's it's very skeptical of science. It's thinking of science not as the it's as a it's it thinks of science as a certain cultural development at a certain moment. Um, and it's you know, and one that actually Wait, can say that again, it thinks of science as what? So Heidegger, let's say in in question concerning technology, thinks of science sociologically partially. Mm -hmm. like, in other words, it's a certain cultural development at a certain moment for certain purposes. It's not a revelation of the truth. So he's treating it genealogically the way Nietzsche does. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like yeah, and you know, so and he's suspicious that it's actually concealing a whole bunch of the truth about the world. You know. So like, and you get more and more of that in the continental vein, maybe working off of Heidegger. So, you know, Foucault is extremely skeptical of science. Uh, you know, people like Bataille, for God's right. sake, or uh, and then the po and post-structuralism is a reaction to a scientistic movement within the continental tradition, which was the the structuralist movement was quite true scientific, right? In, in its aims and in its and its and its method, its a, its effort yeah. to sort of achieve a certain kind of rigor and clarity. That's true. So, so in other words, you, what you say, it almost sounds like you're saying, look, there was a general kind of scientific moment at the turn of the century, and the and it produced, in a sense, the analytic tradition, which then sort of ran with it consistently. Yes. The continental tradition it produced a kind of a a, a schism. Yes. Um, that eventually was won by by the people who reacted against it. I yeah, guess. there was almost a backlash maybe against that scientific moment in continental philosophy. And then maybe it ends up like with the sociology of science stuff, you know, later on, like Latour or somebody like that in the yeah. 80s. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but but it's a complex thing, as you're saying. Structuralism was not, of course, not primarily coming from philosophy. Right. right. You know, it's coming from anthropology. Yeah, I'm thinking about Saussure, right? Um, yeah. Which I, which, I learned in, which I learned in linguistics. Yes. Um, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, you've, right. you've given a little history of, of how this happens. Now, maybe you could say a little bit about, in terms of the substance and the style, what you see as the primary differences between the two traditions. Yeah. Well, and I think, I might, I might be quoting Rorty here. I mean, I kind of like internalized a lot of Rorty without being sure who was doing what. Uh, but the way he looked at it, it was basically a difference in prose styles. All right. And I think whatever one thinks about the, the content of these things, that's definitely true. Like, you know, so these were very different ways of writing. Yes. Uh, yeah. But and do you characterize the difference? I mean, I used to think that the difference was that the continental tradition was more a literary prose style and the analytic tradition was more of a science influenced prose style. But I don't actually know if I think that works because a lot of the, um, the continental writing is really bad writing, right? Um, it's very jargon filled. Um, it's, it's, it's not anything that re that's pleasant or, or beautiful. And so I don't know that characterizing it as literary is quite correct. Um, how right, do you I mean, characterize the stylistic difference? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I think it's definitely, it, there's elements where it's a lot more literary. Obviously, the existentialist move, even Heidegger maybe, but Heidegger isn't really writing in a literary vein. Uh, he's developing his own whole vocabulary, really. He's making up a language almost. Um, well, I think that, you know, the, I mean, the analytic style is premise, premise, conclusion. You know what I mean? Like the model is given by logical argument, uh, by logic. Um, and also there's an ethic of clarity, okay? Which is not to say this, a lot of stuff isn't hard as hell to read or that you don't have to like really know a lot to understand it. But if you are an analytic philosopher, you had better be trying to be as clear as humanly possible. Right. Okay. And I got to say, like, I respect that immensely. But I think of it like so, almost like a strunk and white uh, elements of style, uh, prose approach. Yeah. You know, like, 
just the facts like to, as plainly as possible. Um, whereas, you know, I just think there was all kinds of stylistic experimentation in the continental tradition. Um, stylistic all experimentation sort of, is what you said. Yes. Stylistic for, experimentation. Yeah. You're, yeah. Am I cutting out now? A little bit. Yeah. All right. Hold on. I'm going to pause. I'm going to okay. pause. Hold on. That's all right. <laughs> hey, everyone. Sorry about that. Am I cutting out again now? <laughs> a little bit, man. It's a little bit. Okay. It's okay. Okay. Um, yeah, we're so just going to have to do a DIY for a little while. Um, am I cutting out? I, I, I noticed that when I cut out, it seems like I noticed lag in my video. Yeah. Was that, was that cut out or did you get that? I think I got it. Okay. You sound good. Go on. Um, yeah. Um, th so there's I, more, you said there was a lot of stylistic experimentation on the part of the continental philosophers, yeah. whereas the analytic philosophers were always aiming for a kind of clarity and logical um, right. tightness, so to speak. Yeah, and so they kind of converged. Uh, and, I mean, analytic philosophers kind of converged on a style because they were all, they sort of had the same goal, you know, like clarity, you know, lo various logical techniques to make the argument. It was argumentative, right, which is not necessarily exactly the, the case in all continental philosophy. All right, so let me stop you right there because that's very interesting. And, and I am an analytic partisan, so I'm, th this argument, what I'm going to now say is obviously uh, inflected by that. but. It seems to me you can make the case then that the analytic method is truer to the long-standing history of philosophy in that both the Socratic and the Aristotelian original traditions aimed at logical clarity and tightness, right? They're both argumentative. It's just that the Socratic is more um, um, uh, uh, dis discourse, discourse related and the and the and the Aristotelian lends itself actually to more formalization to a certain extent. Yes, it sounds to me like the continental tradition really, if you wanted to talk about its spiritual its spiritual origins, it comes out of the sort of the aphoristic style of Nietzsche. Well, that's part of it for sure. I, I think a lot of elements. it's not it's not something that you're going to be able to really trace back to Aristotle and Plato, right? I mean, well, I mean, I think. I guess I think philosophy has had a lot of different styles and moves. So, I mean, one way to read Plato, of course, is basically reconstructing the arguments, you know, which are basically logical arguments. But there's a lot of literary material in Plato. That I agree has, with that. Yeah, but yeah, that might have a it might have a philosophical purpose if you didn't think of philosophy necessarily as a series of arguments. So all the myths in Plato, yeah. you know, all all the asides, all the scene yeah. setting. But a lot of those are used to illustrate points that are also makeable argumentatively, right? I mean, like the like you know the the the, the famous image, you know, the cave myth, right? Right. Um, is 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 something that's used to illustrate a point that you could make argumentatively, right? Yes. Um. Um. I'm look. Yeah. I'm not trying to sort of you know say aha, you know, continental right. philosophy. I'm just what I'm saying is, it does seem to me a little. And it's fair to say that philosophy traditionally, its main line has been argumentative, right? I mean, that is, that's why it's not literature, right? I mean, that's... Well, I'm not entirely sure about this. I mean, okay, I think, I, I, I guess I see it that way. But like, I mean, I, I see what you're saying. And I think of it that way. And there's a borderline. So like, you know, someone like Montaigne and some of the great yes. essayists or like Erasmus yes, yeah. and stuff, they're, they're, I would exactly. call them philosophical essayists, right? In other words, they are on the borderline between the, the, the literary and the philosophical. And maybe, you know, someone like Plato is halfway into the philosophical, but still with a foot in the literary. Someone like Quine is all the way in the philosophical. Right. Someone like, you know, Heidegger <coughs> or these people that you're talking about in which there's really very little by way of arguments, they're more... <laughs> yeah. Well... Okay, but think of, I guess I would say, think of Pascal, yeah. someone like Kierkegaard, someone like Nietzsche. They're definitely not primarily making arguments. Right. Okay? Which is not to say that they're not making claims and supporting those claims somehow, right? Like, uh, say, a genealogical approach, for example, in Nietzsche. Right. Or, right. you know they're, what I mean? They're, they're making claims. They're not, I'm repeating only because you cut out. They're making claims. They are supporting the claims. 
but they're not necessarily supporting the claims argumentatively. Right. Nietzsche supports the claims genealogically. But of right. course, this, just, this trades on an ambiguity of what you mean by support, right? Sure. Um, sure. Um, because a lot of people would say that's not support in the sense of, war of, of providing any kind of warrants. Now, I know that you don't accept the notion of warrant. You're, you're, very, you're very skeptical about epistemology, right? Um, well, it's not that I don't accept the idea that some, you know, you can have better or worse reasons for believing something or that you could be warranted or not. It's yeah. just, you know, uh, but yeah, and I, I'm not sure if you can support a position aphoristically. Like, you can motivate it, you can, uh, like, make it seem attractive, or you can, and in a way, you're probably giving reasons in that process, like if you're Nietzsche or whatever. Um, but yeah, I think that they definitely have different conceptions of philosophical methodology by the time you get pretty far into this, you know. And I, it's definitely true that many of the continental philosophers are not primarily concerned with giving arguments. Yeah, this is very interesting, and I, I'm more and more starting to think that Nietzsche is actually absolutely crucial because, of course, it's Nietzsche who rehabilitates the the, the sophists, right? Um, 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 you know, because in a lot of what we're talking about, this arguing over what we mean by support, right? Um, sure. The whole point of Socrates' fight with the sophists was that what those guys are doing is not support, right? Um, right. Um, what, what those guys are doing is kind of rhetorical manipulation of opinion. Right. Yes. Um, which is not the same as support because it's not truth functional. Right. Um, um, there, the, there might be many ways to the truth. The fact that I can convince you of something doesn't mean that it's more that what I've convinced you of is more likely to be true. Right. I mean, that does require something along the lines of what we would call argumentative warrant. Um, and it seems to me that Nietzsche is one of the one of the major figures who pushes back against that Socratic prejudice, if you want to call it. Um, um, and and b partly because he thinks that genealogical arguments are a kind of support. Yes. And they wouldn't be truth functionally, right? I mean, they're, they're not truth functional support. Well, Tell me where something comes from is not a reason for thinking it's true or false. Right. All right. Maybe that's Sorry. right. Sorry, I'm being difficult. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, I guess I think there are potentially many ways of revealing the truth, okay. many ways, you know, so like I wouldn't say that Nietzsche or Heidegger or Derrida move purely into rhetoric, like move into the idea that, uh, you know, all I'm trying to do here is persuade you or blow you away. Or something okay. Like okay. Uh, but like, I think that, so like say when I read the aphorisms of Pascal or something like that, I often have the sense that I'm being drawn into a truth that maybe that's hard to say that, that maybe can't be reconstructed or supported beautifully in a premise conclusion style. Uh, but also that might be more profound than anything that you could, you know, support in a deductive, you know, or a logical structure. Now, of course, that could be delusory or that could be a rhetorical effect, right? Like, in other words, like, I'm reading Heidegger and I'm going like, wow, I don't understand this, but it seems so profound somehow. And so, like, that's, and so then I go like, well, I'm now I'm a Heideggerian. Yeah. But I think there's more to it in it than that. Like, I think, like, I think poetry, for example, can be a way to, this is heidegger ease, I guess, reveal the truth, right. you know, in some way. Yeah. Uh, you know, so yeah, yeah. I don't, know, want to, I don't want to litigate this, and that's why yeah. I, actually this what you're saying now is really helpful, and it also connects the stylistics difference to the substance differences. What you just said about perhaps the non-argumentative modes of support, if we want to call them that, are sometimes the only way to get at certain kinds of truths that are perhaps the most profound ones. That there right. are truths that are out of the reach of argumentative methods? Is that the yes. idea? Yes. I mean, for example, what if we critiqued argumentative methods? What if someone had, you know, I mean, I think Heidegger actually does think this. There's many truths, or maybe the most profound truths, that you can't reveal. Like, you're taking up a position 
in a certain discourse that arises at a certain time, this kind of argumentative rationalist discourse or whatever. Uh, and now we got to do a genealogy of that. How does that arise? Whose purposes does it serve? Right. Uh, and what does it conceal? Like, what are we incapable of expressing right. at this point? You know, so, and then you might, you, so like you might think to yourself, okay, I'm going to read the Tao Te Ching or something like that. All right, now that doesn't give you an argument for anything, but does it, uh, or maybe it does, maybe there are little bits, but does it reveal something profound? And yeah. so like if you're Heidegger and you're thinking like this kind of scientism, that this, you know, or this logic chopping arises at a certain point, serves certain people's purposes, yeah. and conceals a whole range of experiences. Yeah. This is broadly speaking the hermeneutics of suspicion, right? I mean... In a sense, what, and I think I think Brian Leiter has called it that. I don't know whether he originated the term or not. Um, by the way, Leiter is another one who works both in analytic and conscious yes. conditions. Although I don't think he tends to mix them in his work. In other words, he works in one area and works in another. I don't think he mixes them very much. Huh. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, but again, Brian, if you're, lis if you're listening, I, I apologize if that's wrong. I, I've actually done had him on the program to talk about Marxism. Um, which he knows a lot about. Um, but what you're describing is sort of like, I mean, here is kind of an argument, a meta-argument, for why you can't always rely on arguments, right? In other right. words, if indeed the argumentative structure is situated, let's say, in a frame of reference in which it obscures... Yes. Did I just cut out? <laughs> no, you're all right. If it's... Then you're not going to learn something from the argumentative argument, from the argumentative structure about the truth. And certainly Nietzsche says that. Certainly Freud says that, right? And certainly yes. Marx says that, right? And I guess they are sort of the masters of suspicion, right? I mean, I mean, doesn't Marx say, in a sense, that in a sense, the, the, the capitalist structures hide the truth in, to a certain extent? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Um, um, I guess the problem that I have then is my inclination in that in that situation. I accept that problematic. But my inclination then is to become much humbler about what the truth, what the discoverable truth is. Right. Rather than to start saying, I can find it out in exotic ways. Right. Because unlike science and logic, those ways strike me as completely unconstrained. Well, I, I know what you mean. That's my thought, at least. Yeah. I mean, of course, like logic can't establish itself, right? Or like uh, the, the analytic method can't be used to establish the validity of the analytic method. Right. It's all based on intuitions, ultimately, right? right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, maybe so. Intuitions um, of impossibility, intuition. I mean, that's where you get all the axioms from, right? Or intuitions yes. of possibility and impossibility. But um, I think I think you that's sharp to say, I mean, one problem with continental philosophy is that it does appear to be unconstrained in that way. That's like, why I worry other, about it. Yeah, like, like how would we judge whether what Derrida is saying is true? What, what you know, whose view, you know, who, whose equipment could we use to assess the truth of Heidegger's declarations or something right, like that? Right, right. And, and don't you just get to go on however you feel like now? Yeah. That's uh, why I'm sympathetic to the motivation behind the verification principle, even though it's a very ham-fisted right. uh, principle. Yes. I'm sympathetic, and I guess, look, you can make one or two choices. You can either say, okay, I'm just going to be a lot more humble in what truths I think are, are, are discoverable, or you can go the other way, make leaps of faith of all sorts of kinds and, and do all sorts of things. And I guess maybe that just is just, just determined ultimately by the temperament of the person, probably, to a great degree. Right? True, I think so. But I, I wouldn't say these continental philosophers are unconstrained, though, for the most part. Like, they, they're really working hard on methodology in some way. Yeah. So it's not that Derrida, he has a method, right? Like it's, and it's extremely well worked out, or Gadamer's hermeneutics. You know, in, in other words, does Heidegger have a method? I think so, but it's 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 eccentric to him. You know what I mean? And other people have what used it. Do you think he does? And what did you? How did you characterize it? It's but it's eccentric to him. It's eccentric, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but then other people have taken it up. So like Gadamer, who was Heidegger's student, 
he has incredibly elaborate, careful methodology. And he purports basically to derive it from Heidegger, I guess, you know? Um, so like the Continentals are, they're often really worried about methodological questions, but there's maybe no common ground among a wide swath of history or a whole bunch of people about what, you know, so post-structuralism sounds like a method. I mean, is this supposed to be the method that Foucault has in common with Derrida, has in common with Deleuze, has in common with, you know, and the answer is like, basically, no. I mean, there's, there's no single method. But all of those figures are really worried about what method they're using and what its relation is to the truth and what is truth and all that stuff. So, like, I, in some ways, someone like Gadamer or Foucault, they're, in their own way, they're similarly rigorous, I think. But, but you know, the logic they're using is, is maybe not, you know, is, as beautifully codified or something like that. And it's maybe not as uncontroversial within their sphere either. But they, they are they're, they're constraining themselves and trying to constrain each other all the time, you yeah. know, to the deconstructive method. Admittedly, that's, you know, that's elusive. Like, what the hell is that? But we can say some stuff about what it is, you know. But um, so, yeah, I mean, I feel the, the attraction, as you say, like of the verification principle or whatever. Like, it gives you grounds for saying, well, we don't have to worry about this, you know, <laughs> or like nothing's going on there. And sometimes that's quite true, you know. And then this feeling of like sort of methodological chaos that you got on the Continental side. But I will say, like, the Continentals, though, are really worried about methodology, though. Like, they're, they're aware of their own problem in a way that along those lines. I think there's a way of expressing the verification, verification principle, and it's the way Ayer expresses it, that comes off as very dismissive. Yeah. Uh, but I think that one could be motivated to it by humility as opposed to dismissing. Yeah. So in other words... It's not about me saying, well, that stuff is all bullshit or not. No, you know, it's more a matter of this is the limits of what I can know. Yes. Because this is the limits of what I know how to verify, right? Yes. Um, if someday I can figure out some way to verify those claims, I'm happy to, you know, expand my, my net. But right now, this is how I know how to confirm things. And right. I, oh, you know, yes. You know, I, I'm not prepared to make leaps of faith or I'm not prepared to accept experimental language that I don't know what it means, um, you know, and so I, I could see a humble version yeah. of the positivist sort of project, but and I don't maybe think that's where this version is humble, right? It's the opposite of humble, right? Right. Well, and maybe that's where Wittgenstein went, right? In the later Wittgenstein, like a, it's not that he totally abandoned that, like what, you know, but uh, yeah, but it's a more humble version i guess i i was I, I guess i resist like a priori declarations that this area is off limits or that yeah. this kind of claim cannot be supported yeah or and also a priori prescriptions that say these are the only ways that any claim can be supported yeah you know um yeah so and and you know of course a are in the positivist they explicitly abandoned most of philosophy, right? Like they just said, like, we, we can't do aesthetics. Right. Okay. And, and I mean, I think Heidegger in a way, like just comes right back at that and says like, well, that would be too bad. Yeah. Uh, you know, so let's do some aesthetics or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, or even ethics, although ethics came back in a big way in analytic philosophy, you know, or political philosophy, yeah. you know? So, um, so, early analytic philosophy is abandoning so much of the discipline, ethics, aesthetics, philosophy of religion, yeah. metaphysics. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Like almost the whole discipline. Yeah. And, and, you know, I can understand why people sitting in Europe or whatever were going like, no, I'm still interested in those things. And if your criterion of meaning is eliminating all that, well, guess what? I don't like your criterion of meaning. You know what I mean? I can and, understand uh, why people, I'm just repeating because you cut out, you can understand why people were not willing to eliminate so much. Right? Yeah. Um, 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 and to be fair, I mean, the analytic tradition itself wasn't, wasn't willing to eliminate so much. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't very long after air. 
that we get some of the best work in moral political philosophy coming out of the analytic tradition. I mean, you know, how many years after language, truth, and logic, you know, is, you know, all the, the great mid-century works of moral philosophy? I mean, not, not very much, right? I mean, yeah, um, true. And, um, true. And, uh, and look, I mean, and a lot of the people never went away. You know, the utilitarians never went away, right? True. Um, That's true, too. Um, well, uh, yeah. I wonder what how. I wonder about how GEM, Ams, Anscom, or Philip Foot or people like that thought about the continental analytic split, or thought about people like Ayer. I don't, I don't yeah, know enough I, I about that. I, mean, um, um, I don't know. I mean, and I have all of Anscom's collected writings, which I'm working my way through, because they just released them in a series. Um, I guess I saw that a little bit, yeah. Because I think she, I, I actually am love, in love with her um, um, work. Uh, I see why even though so much of her stuff is just completely antithetical to my own orientation because she's a very orthodox Catholic. Yeah. Uh, but um, I just love the way she did philosophy, very rigorous, but with plenty of style yeah. and plenty of her personality in it, which I really liked. Um, but you I know, go back to Hanscom. It's you been know, a while. Not just the later Wittgenstein, the early Wittgenstein was humble in this way. The whole end of the Tractatus is sure. the articulation of that sure. humility bracketing off what can be said and what cannot, right? Yes. But what can only be shown, and if you think about it, what cannot be said but only shown is most of it. <laughs> right, I know. But see, that 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 would irk Heidegger. I know, but I kind of like that because to me that's, I guess maybe that's in line with sort of my, my very deep humanism, right? I mean, sort of in the sense that, you know, I'm respectful of the limits of what I can know Right. And I'm not willing to just sort of, it's not that I'm not willing to speculate, but that when I do, I want to be very clear that I'm doing a very, I'm engaged in a very different kind of activity. So, you know, even on my own magazine that I publish, I have separate categories for the things I do that are just sort of ranty or wild speculation. Right. I don't even call them essays, right? Okay. Because, because I guess I'm sort of cognizant that this stuff is just, my intuition's running wild, or this stuff is just, and I'm in, inclined to be kind of constrained because I just think it's a, there's a kind of responsibility to, to be so. But I, that just may be temperament. I'm not really making a yeah. case for it, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think in a way this might account a little bit for, say, that language of Heidegger, which is so hard. I've just been trying to teach it to undergraduates, for God's sakes. <laughs> uh, Undergraduates, yeah. well, there, there. That's your first mistake, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, they, they're pretty into it, but not that. Not that any of us understood it really. Um, but I think, like, like maybe you know, Heidegger comes to the end of the Tractatus. I don't know if you read it or not. Uh, and he goes, "Okay, my conclusion is we need to bend language in a different direction." Wait a You're cutting out. Uh, yeah, we're, is this going to be messed up? We're not going to go much further, but let's just get this last part in. Okay. You just were saying that Heidegger is talking about the end of the Tractatus. Well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm speculating. I'm imagining a, a fairly young Martin Heidegger reading the Tractatus of Wittgenstein and coming to the end and going, that's a challenge to me to do something in language that appears impossible to Ludwig Wittgenstein. I'm going to try to show in language what cannot be shown in language. And to do that, I'm going to have to kind of like invent, a, voca invent a new vocabulary. Yes. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I don't think that's actually the story of how Heidegger came to his vocabulary, but I think that's kind of what he's doing. Like, he's struggling to say things or show things through language that cannot be stated in language, or at least not precisely, right? And, you know, so, and, and so, like, I, he's quite consciously, like, trying to defamiliarize language, like, introduce new terms, bend old terms, deal with these crazy animal, animologies, reinterpret words, go back to the origins of uh, Western philosophy and, and, and work with the vocabulary or something. Like, maybe his response is, like, I don't know if I can show this in language or not, but I'm going to take a shot at it, okay? Yeah. Like, uh, you know... I, I don't know. But. I don't, no, I don't. That last thing was that I don't know whether I can show this in language, say this in language or not. But I'm going to make it take a shot at it. Yeah, um, is a is a is a good way to think about it. And um, while it probably doesn't capture all 
of the continental philosophy, certainly, it certainly does capture sort of maybe a main thread of it, um, um, a, one of the most important threads of it. Um, yeah, I think so. Talk about and write about the stuff that at the end of Wittgenstein's try to say, hey, this, Wittgenstein said this can only be shown and not said. Right. And then it's up to the audience to decide whether they think that's wisdom or folly, right? Right. Um, um, <laughs> and, and, and maybe you can show in language. Like maybe, you know, you could try to break this down or just make it, I mean, that's part of the weirdness of these texts. I think of Heidegger and Derrida especially. They, they don't, I, I, they, I think in their own account, I think they are obscurantists, okay? Like I think they, they are purposefully obscure, especially yeah. Derrida, both of them. But their account of what they're doing is like they're defamiliarizing language. They're pushing language. They're recovering forgotten aspects of language they it needs to sound weird because they're trying to do things that are apparently impossible in language in certain ways you yeah. know but yeah yeah unfortunately our connection now is just getting yeah. worse it's getting worse and worse and so yeah. i'm not going to torture the audience um uh we can try to do this again in, in a clearer way at some well, point well we're going to do this well no i'm not i'm hoping that we don't have to re-record re re this because i think we did it really well okay. um but um we won't do many more dialogues like this. Um, <coughs> yeah, it's too bad, man. As I explained to everyone, this is because of my circumstances. Um, and so I won't, they won't have to suffer Wi-Fi video discussions again. Crispin, thank you so much. Thank you. I hope your circumstances get better, man. <laughs> I appreciate I that. The family's okay and everything. <clears throat> I appreciate that. And um, I'll be shouting at you for another one uh, Another one pretty soon, all right? All right, sounds good. All right, take care.